Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum everyone. So today I found out that there is this initiative started by, I think by a sister. May Allah reward her to um, answer this question, why I do taqlid? And I think it's great and I would encourage everybody who does do taqlid, which is most likely the majority of us, to, to definitely post a video and, and, and to definitely give your reasons why, to kind of encourage um, this return to a practice that really has been the practice of, of the Muslims for centuries until only uh, recently. So I thought to gain the reward and to participate and contribute to this initiative, I would post my own video giving my own reasons why I do taqlid. So why do I do taqlid? There are many reasons. Some I've learned from my teachers, some from my readings, and also some personal reasons which I'm sure are shared by many other people. Uh, amongst the Muslims. The first is that we've been commanded to do so uh, in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ask those who possess the message if you do not know. You know, those of knowledge. For us who whose knowledge does not encompass the vast meanings of the Quran, the vast meanings of the Hadith, the vast understandings of the Sahaba, the Tabi'in, Taba Tabi'in, the Salaf al-Salihin, uh, we, we have taqlid. We have the ability or this this opportunity to follow um, the scholars of the past and their understandings, uh, knowing that they were rightly guided, they had a proper understanding of the deen, and if we follow them, we'll be guided as well. All right, and this is one of the promises of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that if we follow the scholars of the past, we will be guided. Uh, it, it is my connection to the Sunnah of the Prophet by making taklid on the Imams. I ensure that. I'm connecting my practices in my deen to, to the true practices of the sunnah as it's been transmitted to us, which I'll explain in subsequent slides. It ensures that my worship is sound and according to the sunnah of our Prophet as, has been, as it has been authentically transmitted uh, to me. And this is a very important point that I'll talk in another, about in another slide. This idea of uh, transmitting the, the knowledge um, from the time of the Salaf Salihin to our times. Uh, the next is, it is the way of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. You know, the, the overwhelming majority of the Sunni Muslims for the past 14 centuries have followed a madhab. It's, it's only been in, in the past maybe century, maybe a few decades ago, where this issue of taqlid has even been, been risen for, for a lot of different uh, reasons. And so just to reemphasize that it has been the practice of this Ummah and its scholars for centuries. And that in itself, just knowing the great scholars of the past and their knowledge of the deen, you know, their practice, if, if, they, are, if they made taqlid on the Mujtahid Imams, it's good for me too. So quickly, what is taqlid? A very simple definition. Simply, taqlid is following someone else's rulings without necessarily knowing the proofs. And specifically for our deen of Islam, it's following the rulings of qualified scholars, and in this case, the mujahid imams and their madhabs and the scholars that followed and worked on their madhabs, following them without necessarily knowing their proofs. You know, taqlid is, is such a simple, basic idea, and it's so ubiquitous in society, both in, in our practice of the deen and in our regular lives. It, it makes you scratch your head why anybody would would have anything against it or, or raise an objection to it. Everybody does taqlid in their lives because we are not absolute, complete experts in every aspect of our lives that we need to, you know, facilitate. You know, if you're sick, you go to a doctor and that doctor will give you, prescribe you a type of medicine. Nobody in their right mind would ask that doctor, along with that medicine, to provide them with a journal publication proving that medicine would work. Nobody would ever do that. You know, you, you take the prescription. Some people can't even read the, 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 the chemical in, in, in that drug that can help them. They take it to the, the, the pharmacy, they pay their money, they take the drug, and they get better. You know, if somebody has a legal issue, they'll go to a lawyer. The lawyer will say, you have to file this claim or you have to apply for this. This is what you need to do. And some people will follow it, right? People follow it. Nobody would never ask that lawyer if they can provide the the history of the case or the precedents for that ruling and why it makes sense right society works on people regular people like you and me trusting scholars in their own fields to understand preserve the 
areas of knowledge that they've studied so other 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 people like us can continue on with our lives all right and it's the same thing with our dean you know for some reason people will do tech lead in every aspect of their lives but when it comes to the dean it completely passes by them but this is what we're doing we are following the trustworthy imams of the past in their understanding of the dean because we are not scholars in our own right and we do not have the knowledge and the ability or the time to be able to study the primary text to understand how to practice it and the key thing is trust you know tech lead is 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 based on trust trusting the guidance and the knowledge of the of uh, scholars that have come before us and we know we can trust them because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us he said you know the 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 hand of allah is with the jama right and the jama will never disagree or, or will ne the jama will never agree on falsehood so we have many many hadiths confirming that we can trust the scholars of the past and we can trust the jama so this trust is 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 is, is, is secured by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in making taqlid on the imams of the past so another point that i really want to emphasize is that when we make taqlid on one of the mujtahid imams it is a connection to the Prophet. There are many connections, ways to connect yourself to the Prophet, but this is a connection to the Prophet. It connects your practices of your deen to the practices of the Prophet through living transmission from his time to ours. So what I have here on the slide is the taqlid of the mujtah imams, i.e. following a madhab. When you, one does this, one is following the practices of the Prophet as it was understood, interpreted, and practiced by the Sahaba, Tabi'in, those who followed him, the Tabi'in, -tabi those who followed the Tabi'in, and the Salaf al-Salihin. That, that's what you're doing. You know, when we say we follow Abu Hanifa, we're not saying we're following Abu Hanifa um, in exclusion to the practices of the Prophet. No, what we're saying is that Abu Hanifa took his understanding and his madhab and the scholars that followed him took their understanding from the Salaf al-Salihin, from the Tabi'in, the Teba Tabi'in, the Sahaba, who took their, their understanding of the practice of the Deen from the Prophet. And that's been transmitted to us through this Madhab to our day. So when we follow a Madhab, we are following the practices of the Prophet as it's been transmitted and understood through these great scholars. And that's what I hear here. The Madhab is an authentic and contiguous transmission of this fiqh, the fiqh of the Salaf al-Salihin, to our present day, as it's been perfected, checked, rechecked, validated, revalidated by the scholars of the Madhabs over the centuries. And it's a very, very beautiful thing, and it's something very unique to our deen, this, this concept of living scholarship, that a scholar has studied under a scholar who has studied as under a scholar and has taken the practice all the way back to the Prophet. It's a, a, a beautiful thing, and it's something very unique to our deen. So to reemphasize this idea of living transmission, and this is something that the madhabs have. When you follow a madhab, when you do taqlid on, uh, on one of the imams, you are following the deen and you are practicing in a way that has been transmitted authoritatively, authentically, all the way back to the Prophet. Right? And it's in, this is a very important aspect of, of the deen. As Imam al laqani said, every good is in following those before. And every evil is is in the invention of those that followed. You know, one of the pillars of the kind of degradation of our society today is our disconnection or our leaving our traditions for things modern, be it because of some kind of uh, social study or political movement or some whim of the masses. Uh, we, we, we think that this is better than the traditions that we've relied on for thousands of years, whether they be religiously or something else. And, and that's a big reason why we're kind of, society is kind of going to the dumpster, because we're, we're not connecting ourselves with the wisdom and the knowledge of the past. And it's very much the same with our deen. And as Ibn Mubarak also said, um, Isnad is from this deen. Isnad is from the religion. If it wasn't for Isnad, anyone would have said anything. And, and this is what ensures that the deen is transmitted and the, the, the practices of the Prophet is preserved, that people study under scholars who have studied under scholars all the way back to the Prophet. If it wasn't for that, any person can go into the library, open the books of Hadith, open the Quran, and just with freak 
freak uh, modes of thinking come up with their practices and this is what's happening today and this is not what we want we want the practice we want to follow the Quran and Sunnah as it has been practiced and understood and transmitted to us through authoritative sound chains of transmission to our days so here in this slide I'm showing some of the many many scholars it's certainly not an exhaustive, exhaustive list but a list of scholars many of which many Muslims will know of who made taqlid on the mujtahi imams and followed a madhab, right? And here are the four madhabs. We have uh, the likes of Abu Yusuf, Imam Muhammad, Imam Tahawi. Many people would know Imam Tahawi for his aqidah, Tahawiya. Imam Shurub Bulani, Shurub Bulali. All these scholars, in their own right, and that's that's the Hanafi madhab, but Imam Malik has Imam Qurtubi, Imam Ibn Bututa, um, Ibn Khaldun. Uh, look at Imam Shafi. Four of the great muhaddith imams, Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmi, Nawawi, all made taqlid on Imam Shafi. And Imam Ahab, Ahmed, we have Abu Dawood, Ibn Taymiyyah, I, Imam Ibn, uh, Ibn Jozi, all scholars in their own right. Look at the scholars who follow Imam Shafi. Great muhaddiths, knew hundreds of thousands of hadiths by memory. All of them, when it came to the practice of the deen, they followed Imam Shafi. And just another point for those who don't know, there's a book called Asmal al rijal and it's a, it's a compilation of the biographies of the scholars of Hadith. And the interesting thing about this book is it has four volumes, just four. That's it. And these four volumes are labeled according to the Mujahid Imams, Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Hanbali. If you want to know the biographies of one of these muhaddith scholars you need to know you necessarily need to know the imam they made taqlid on or you wouldn't be able to find it in the book so this is a very important point you know a lot of a lot of times people today they want to exchange uh, the practice of fiqh or the following of a madhab for just following the hadith well I if this was correct the imams of hadith who knew thousands, hundreds of thousands of hadith themselves. They would have been the first people to practice this. But despite their vast knowledge on, uh, on hadith and them being scholars in their own right, they still, when it came to the practices of their deen, they made taqlid on a mujtahid imam and followed a madhab. So that's an important thing to understand and know. So in the next few slides, I just want to, in the next few slides, I just want to discuss some misconceptions that people have about the madhabs and doing taqlid. And this is a big one, you know, taqlid is blind following. It's a very insulting and ignorant statement uh, to say that people who follow um, scholars with such vast knowledge and, 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 and such vast amounts of great ibadah that they performed, for people to say that anybody who follows such imams and their scholars that follow them who are scholars in their own right, to say that they're blind following them is, is very insulting and it's a very ignorant statement. I would say that the opposite is true. For someone to directly access the Quran and the Hadith texts using their own intellect or maybe an assemblage of modern scholars, uh, to do this disconnected from the vast volumes of understanding and knowledge that we've inherited from the countless number of scholars who came before us, to do this, to disconnect oneself from this vast knowledge, this is blind following. This is the true blind following, this disconnection. You know, it's like a person who's lost and they're trying to find their way without a map, right? As opposed to someone who's lost, but they have a map. You know, the person who's lost but has a map, they're not blind. They understand that they don't know their way and they have something to help them. We would never prefer the person who's lost and doesn't have a map thinking, well, they're using their mind. Somehow they are better or more knowledgeable or more better guided. We would never say that. Okay. Another statement that we often hear is people want to follow the prophet, not the, uh, an imam. You know, so the question is, should we follow the prophet or an imam? You know, it begs the question for people who say, I want to follow only the Prophet, or I follow the Prophet and I don't follow an Imam. Other people who follow Imams is wrong because they're following an Imam who follow an Imam who follow an Imam. You know, ask them the question, how did the knowledge of this deen reach you? The Prophet isn't here. He hasn't been here for the past 1400 years. How did the Quran reach you? How did the Hadith reach you? How did the Sunnah reach you? It reached you through the transmission of scholars 
who took their knowledge from scholars